the orga or cult. In order to increase yields or the growth rate of plants, chemicals are used in industrial agriculture today. The most recent successful alternative movements propagate biological growth acceleration with effective microorganisms or products such as mega green, which takes over the nutrient supply as a leaf fertilizer and thus preserves the chemical biological balance in the soil and, incidentally, halves the water requirement of the plant. In the 1930s, however, there was also research into the physical influence of electromagnetic fields on plant growth. From a scientific point of view, this branch was able to come up with quite interesting effects, but the methods developed were never put to wider use. 1987, ein Labor beim Schweizer Pharmagiganten Geigi. Zwei Forscher machen eine sensationelle Entdeckung. In Experimenten setzen sie Getreide und Fischeier einem simplen Hochspannungsfeld aus, in dem kein Strom fließt. Das Resultat ist verblüffend. Wachstum, Ertrag können mit dieser Methode gesteigert werden, ohne Dünger, ohne Pestizide. Gleichzeitig wachsen Urzeitformen heran, die eigentlich gar nicht mehr existieren. Ein Millionen Jahre alter Farben, eine ausgestorbene Riesenforelle. Die Entdeckung wird zum Politikum. Sieber stoppt die Forschung. Sie verschwindet in der Versenkung, ohne dass die Wissenschaft Notiz von ihr nimmt. Einfach gesagt ähm, handelt es sich um ein Spannungspotenzial, ähm, das ein Unterschied ist zwischen oben und unten, in dem eine Pflanze dann darin wächst. Und ähm, oben ist ein negativer Pol und unten ein positiver Pol. Es handelt sich wirklich um eine wissenschaftliche, das darf man ruhig so sagen, um eine wissenschaftliche Sensation wo sie heute den Schleier lüftet. Das ist bis jetzt unter Verschluss geblieben. Pflanzen so wachsen lassen, wie sie vor Jahrmillionen gewachsen sind. Also Pflanzen, die heute gar nicht mehr so wachsen, haben sie wieder können. Ja, Millionen zurückverfolgen, wie haben die dort mal ausgesehen. Und auch da können wir das Geheimnis lüften. Das ist erfahren und an und für sich ist das ein gewöhnlicher Wurmfarm, wie jedermann kennt. Und Sporen von, denen, von, einem, von so einer Wurmfarm haben wir behandelt, wiederum mit dem Elektrofeld. Und was rausgekommen ist, ist der. Farm. Ja. Und das ist also eine Pflanze, die jetzt in dem Jahrhundert und im Jahrtausend so also noch nie gewachsen ist. Wir haben einen Hinweis ja. darauf, ja. denn es gibt solche Farmen, die in versteinerter Form im Boden innen wieder gefunden werden. Mhm. Auf diesem Bild ja. sehen Sie eine solche Form und wenn Sie die Blätter anschauen, sehen Sie auch die Übereinstimmung einigermaßen. Was bedeutet jetzt für Sie als Wissenschaftler, als Forscher, die Forschungsergebnis, dass Sie quasi können leben können, vor Jahrmillionen heute wieder aktivieren? Ja. Das, was die Bedeutung da drinnen könnte sein, ist, dass man hier Erbmerkmale, die durch die Zucht oder durch die Degeneration verloren gegangen sind, wieder können Führer holen und wieder können aktivieren. Der Mais erinnert sich offensichtlich daran, wie er früher einmal beschaffen war. Keine Genmanipulation, keine Chemie. Vermutete Vorteile? Höhere Keimungsrate, höhere Widerstandsfähigkeit gegen Schädlinge und hartes Klima, keine Agrogifte. Sieber begräbt das Projekt, weil die Forscher am eigenen Ast sägen. Mais heute. Eingesetzt werden Hybridsorten, also Mischlingssorten, hochkultiviert und hochempfindlich, deren Samen nicht verwendet werden können. Das heißt, der Bauer muss sein Saatgut jedes Jahr neu kaufen, nicht nur für Mais. Die Saatgutproduktion wiederum wird von multinationalen Konzernen der Nahrungsmittel-, Agrochemie- und Mineralölindustrie beherrscht. Dieselben Konzerne, die auch Dünge, Pflanzenschutz und Unkrautvernichtungsmittel an den Landwirt verkaufen. The closest to success in Germany was the work of Gustav Adolf Winter from Grobjena near Naumburgen der Saar, who was in negotiation with the Reich government in 1932 and who wanted to introduce the orga orkult method he had developed into agriculture. In his own trial area, he was able to come up with high-quality and exceptionally fast-growing crops, two-meter-high kale and tomatoes, with 60 kilograms of fruit on a single perennial have been handed down, and that on pure heath sand without additional fertilization, even without irrigation. In lectures, he promised a shortening of the growing season by one-third to two-thirds, depending on the plant species, which would mean two to three harvests per year. These successes have been well documented in the accompanying book illustration. However, 
an experimental plot commissioned by the Bavarian Ministry of Agriculture was unable or unwilling to reproduce the results documented by Gustav Adolf Winter in 1933. Winter spoke of sabotage and of a plot against him. According to the official historiography, he is supposed to have taken his own life in prison in 1936 after an indictment before the special court in Halle for violation of the law against the new formation of parties of July 14, 1933. Historically, it will probably never be possible to clarify the facts of the case. In any case, a positive independent expert opinion from that time is not available. His alleged suicide can be interpreted in one way or another. According to Gustav Adolf Winter, the effect on which the Orga Urkult was based was discovered by chance on the tracks of the Reichsbahn. Presumably, it was Gustav Winter, a senior railroad official, and perhaps a relative of Gustav Adolf Winter, who also lived in Grobzina at the time, who had noticed that the weeds in the gravel bed tended to grow gigantically on sections of track running exactly north-south in the vicinity of the grounding cables without contact with water or soil. Gustav Adolf Winter succeeded in adapting this constellation of track systems in a modified form for agriculture. Earth antennas were required for the Orga Urkult. Galvanized iron wire took the place of the tracks, as well as electronics, which replaced what coincidentally occurred at the Reichsbahn. In 1936, after negotiations with the Reich government failed, he wanted to publish the structure of these electronics and the construction instructions for the entire system in an appendix to the above-mentioned book. The edition of these brochures were supposedly already printed but it was never delivered and is unfortunately considered lost today. But what was the technological environment of the tracks in question? Were they the usual tracks for steam locomotives at that time, or were they the first electrified lines, which had been equipped with overhead line poles since 1903? The estate of Gustav Adolf Winter does not provide any information about this. However, his book recently experienced a small renaissance in PDF format, and in 2009, some German private researchers set out to reconstruct the system. Two approaches crystallized, derived from the non-electrified line on one side and the electrified line on the other. I had also decided to reconstruct the method developed by Gustav Adolf Winter, and at the first attempt, I opted for the non-electrified line. Many of the effects mentioned in connection with the Orga Urkult had been described in the context of the research known to me, which I supervise as a technology scout. However, only aspects of them were found, and they did not add up to more than a jigsaw puzzle. However, when this puzzle was put together, a promising picture emerged in the overall view, as well as a plausible sketch for the reconstruction of the system developed by Gustav Adolf Winter. The Berlin-based alternative practitioner Jürgen Saldidis develops the electrotherapy CBT-2000, or cell balance therapy. In the context of his own basic research, he reports that oscillating circuits, when aligned north-south, coil in the north, capacitor in the south, are stimulated to self-resonance without the presence of an external current source. This was a crucial clue because I was looking for a self-reinforcing process that occurs in a north-south orientation. In addition, he says that in his electrotherapy, he replaces the coil with the human body, i.e., the body contacted with two electrodes together with a capacitor located to the south becomes a self-exciting oscillating circuit whereby the body can refuel energy in its weakened points. On a virtual level, the wound coil is replaced by a vortex field, which is associated with chakras in alternative medicine. Concerning the comparison with the Orga Urkult, from a physical point of view, one can regard two parallel running rails as a capacitor. If I ground each of the two rails individually with a grounding cable and consider these grounding cables analogous to the electrodes with which Jürgen Sediatis connects the body as a coil, the formation of a self-exciting oscillating circuit between an earth-owned vortex field, or coil, and the rails or the capacitor in the north-south constellation would be conceivable. That there was something to this kind of earth antenna was also known from other sources. In the book Lost Science, Jerry Vasilitos describes the possibility of extracting electricity from the Earth by means of two Earth antennas, 
iron or coal. However, this would not work equally well at every point. One would have to do a lot of trial and error and measure with a galvanometer until one found suitable points. Once tapped, the current flows for months. If one of the earth antennas is pulled out of the ground for a while, the effect is usually gone and does not reappear at the same place. The idea of obtaining and using ground energy is covered in secrecy. What would happen to fossil fuel companies were it even suspected that vast electrical energy could simply be pulled from the ground at specific points? Well-placed telegraphic ground plates were able to operate with energy simply taken from the ground. Several early telegraph lines historically continued signaling among stations, though their batteries had been dry and dead for several years. I spoke to an engineer who saw this kind of system operation when yet a teenager. Seeing this strange system in full working order so impressed him that, developing that rare taste, he forever sought such anomalies as a lifelong passion. Numerous articles from the last century retell exact details concerning these phenomena. It is possible to demonstrate its principle with ground rods and galvanometers. Yes, there is great energy in the earth, vast natural energy that is accessible only in specific points. But the true and fundamental identity of that energy has been questioned. Most qualified investigators observe that ground energy does not begin as an electricity. Electricity from the ground only appears after several natural stages of transformation. Vegetative growth. This is evidenced in old telegraph lines, where measured currents do not provide adequate wattage for the activities which are thereafter observed in the components. This was especially true for the forgotten chemical telegraph systems, where scarcely any electrical current managed the successful exchange of strong signals. The forgotten science of selecting special ground sites is re-emerging among VLF radio researchers. No two ground sites are ever the same. It is possible to probe around in a garden with simple meters and metal rods to prove this claim. Touching carbon and iron rods to the ground registers as currents only when specific points are touched. It is fascinating to find extremely active sensitivity spots immediately adjacent to points which produce absolutely no response in meters. The effects measurably increase despite rod separations. In no manner can these be referred to as electrolytic or battery actions, since the requirement for best energy extraction by this method is dry ground. Rainwater destroys these effects. Moreover, it is only when the right ground contacts are made that one will watch the meter pin. There, the meter will remain until the rods are removed. Such energetic discharges can continue for months. Removing the rods, however, produces a more astounding phenomenon. The meter, dropping to zero, does not rise again when the rods are replaced in their very same ground points. One can lift one rod out of its well, watch the meter drop, and then instantly replace the rod with no resultant energy rise. Ground energy withdraws in a manner suggestive of biological irritation. Each of these phenomena may be demonstrated to personal satisfaction with very simple apparatus. Very similar in structure to the Earth battery is the Earth radio, as it was developed in the military field for tap-proof communication. A 2-3 to three meter long iron rod is driven into the ground, then, 12 further iron rods are placed symmetrically in a circle at intervals of 2 meters. A galvanometer is used to measure which of the rods in the periphery has the highest voltage compared to the central rod. Now, an artificial signal is superimposed on the Earth's own signal. At a distance of up to 200 kilometers, the information-carrying signal can be picked up again with the help of an identical setup. According to my informant from the military, the Earth's own signal is an alternating current accompanied by longitudinal fields, which only flows through iron, but not through copper, and can only be detected with a galvanometer. If one wanted to use it technically, it would have to be superimposed by a direct voltage, so that in the process, a pulse direct current would be generated, with which one could charge a battery. The analogy between the system of the Orga Urkult and the discoveries of Jürgen Sediatis is obvious and easily comprehensible on a pictorial level. The question is only what kind of a vortex field should be formed in the Earth 
in analogy to the coil function of the human body. The insertion of two identical earth antennas is not very helpful here visually for the understanding of the field form. However, the testing of a system for the earth radio with 12 concentric antennas suggests that the vortex is formed around one of the two antennas, where this forms the vortex core and the other antenna is in the wind. Without being able to say what the nature of this vortex is, one can say on an abstract level that a strong potential is formed between the vortex core and the periphery. In an air vortex, to choose an analogy, this potential would be the pressure difference. This potential, however, is tapped by the two earth antennas and is fixed in the wires as magnetic current and builds up as potential between the wires. With this, I thought at that time, an approach would be available, which could lead to a reconstruction of the lost electronics of the Orga Urkult. I got help for the field work and in order to raise the, albeit small, costs for the plant. In October 2009, I placed a first test plant on suitable sandy soil in Prignitz. I used galvanized iron rods of 3 meters in length, galvanized iron wire, and the distance between the ground antennas and the wires was 2 meters. The experiment was unsuccessful in terms of plant growth. The effect on the compass needle described by Winter could be demonstrated on the antennas, but not on the wires. What had gone wrong? Did it need an earth antenna made of copper, which picks up the signal but does not short-circuit the current on the ground? According to my research, the earth cables of the Reichsbahn were also made of copper. Or had the former railway supervisor at that time discovered the effect on the electrified lines and it was completely different effects that played a role? In this sense, Helmut Nagel, who lives in Trier, played the other card. He started from an electrified line and came up with the following setup. The rail here has only one grounding cable. The other side is connected to a simulated overhead line pole, which was made of galvanized iron, as was customary at the time. The system ran as described by Gustav Adolf Winter. With the help of an external 1.5 volt power source with 8 watts of power, up close, the company's reconstruction of Winter's knowledge may take another summer or two. It is certain that this knowledge will fall on fertile ground in Janan.